yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I'm with Aristotle. Um, I think uh, there's, uh, there's the mean and lowly things in life have got an enormous amount of things to teach us. And sometimes um, their stories get somewhat overshadowed by the so-called charismatic megafauna. Um, and um, I sort of, uh, I like to think that I'm here to put a bit of popular spin on maybe some of the um, less charismatic microfauna, um, like um, this guy here. Um, he's really a poster child for the uncharismatic microfauna. Um, and that's, that's just from how he looks. You don't even know what he's called yet. This, my friends, is Talmatobius culius, which is Latin for the um, aquatic scrotum frog. So <laughs> he, got, he got dealt a pretty bum deal in the PR stakes right from the moment that he was named. And it's pretty undignified, to be honest, for an animal that is... Um, He's, you know, he's, he's managed to, to colonise one of the most inhospitable places on earth. He's a bit like Sir Edmund Hillary and Harry Houdini, all rolled into one. Um, he lives at the bottom of Lake Titicaca, which is um, 13,000 feet in the air, and he lives uh, at the bottom of the lake um, to protect himself from the harmful UV um, rays and the freezing temperatures. Um, and because he lives at the bottom of the lake, um, he has had to uh, evolve to breathe only through his skin, which is why it's evolved into these copious, saggy folds to increase the surface area so he, he can breathe through his skin alone. And ironically, when he needs, uh, well, he's a little bit out of breath, he actually does um, press-ups in order to increase the circulation around his body um, and, um, and get more oxygen into his system. And, you know, I mean, I think that is amazing. <laughs> I mean, you know, I really admire this frog, you know, but, I mean, what happens? He gets named after somebody's testicles and forgotten about, you know, which I think is not fair. So I'm all about sort of bringing these stories um, out into the open. And, and I, I'm a bit of a frog nut, I have to admit. I first fell in love with a frog when I was eight years old. This was the frog that I fell in love with. Um, he was on cover of a book that completely changed my life. Um, uh, David Attenborough's Life on Earth became my Bible. It introduced me to the miracle of evolution and um, the diversity of, of life. Um, and uh, I became a, a nature nut ever since then. And I was obsessed with evolution. I was very lucky. I went on to, to study under Richard Dawkins at Oxford. Um, and then my glittering zoology career <laughs> ended <laughs> when I, I didn't go into science. And I just, I went into filmmaking actually I, well first of all I was I was kidnapped by comedy and then and then I went and worked and made popular factual programs that weren't even about animals <laughs> they were about um, history and architecture and things like that um, so anyway I uh, I didn't um, I didn't really uh, get sort of to make sort of zoology I didn't go back to zip up my zoology boots until um, I came across a story that I just couldn't ignore um, and uh, it was the story that the world's amphibians are, are, are in decline. It's the worst extinction crisis since the dinosaurs were wiped off the planet. And as soon as I heard about this story, I thought, right, I've got to tell. This is the story I've got. I've been waiting for to, you know, to to and to tell. And I, I went to go and see um, commissioning editors who who knew my work and you know asked them if they'd give me some money I could go off and make a film and uh, and nobody would give me any money and uh, I hounded uh, people and uh, I remember chasing one commissioning editor around a documentary festival only for him to turn to me eventually over a glass of warm Chardonnay virtually chucking it over me in her exasperation and said look I just only want surefire hits about pandas and meerkats okay you know <laughs> and uh, I was just, I just I was just astonished, you know, I couldn't believe that what I see is one of the most important environmental stories of our time was being ignored simply because the star didn't have a furry face. I mean, that to me just seemed extraordinary. So, um, but the good th news is, is that, um, you know, I, d I don't take no for an answer pr very easily and, and lucky I, I don't have to these days because um, our media landscape has moved from the limitations, the expensive limitations of this, to the almost limitless world of this. So, basically I thought, right, there's been a digital revolution, I'm going to join it. And um, so <laughs> I, um, I quit my job and I bought a ticket to South America and, um, and I headed off to have a six month, six, month, six month adventure as the Amphibian Avenger. <laughs> I, um, I really did have a frog mask and a cape. <laughs> 
I didn't wear it very often. I didn't wear it all the time, but I really did. And, and, and the reason why uh, <laughs> I gave myself a silly name um, is um, not because I actually had fantasies about being a superhero, although it is a nice thought. <laughs> um, but um, uh, it, it's, it's just, I mean, I do sort of see where that commissioning editor was coming from. And I think that the audience is a bit jaded by a conservation message and doom and gloom messages that the world is going to end. And we're all going to feel really guilty about it. And so, and I think if you want to tell a story and you want to reach a really wide audience, I think you have to be a bit playful with it and you you know or it helps to be playful and, and to be humorous and I, I really think that that humor can be the sort of sugar coating that um, covers the bitter pill of a, of a difficult message so I uh, I called myself the amphibian Avenger and I my uh, my mission was to um, uh, to find some of the most spectacular amphibians so here's some from my scrapbook that I saw along the way I mean look at how cool these animals are they look like space aliens you know they're really amazing um, uh, animals. So I thought I'm going to find the most amazing amphibians that I can and track down the most sort of compelling stories. And I documented them all in my blog. Um, and um, so I traveled around for six months and it was a bit of a gonzo journey. I did have a frog mask and cape. But I didn't have a lot of a plan, to be honest. <laughs> and I think that was kind of the fun bit because I was able to sort of take my audience with me on this particular journey, which I'd never been able to when you're a documentary maker, you spend months squirreling away and then you deliver this perfect thing. But this was like a real time adventure. And I, I broadcast a sort of my content on Twitter and Facebook and, 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 up, up, um, and wrote fairly regularly. And I tried to have kind of the most sort of um, find find really kind of amazing stories and and tell them with humor and and to try and reach as big an audience as possible um, and I, I did some sort of slightly I did lots of really amazing things I did lick poison dart frogs and I and I visited fungus infested frog farms and um, I, and I found Mr. Scrotum actually uh, and um, but unfortunately he was in a blender in a uh, in downtown Peru uh, Lima where he was being uh, uh, drunk as an aphrodisiac anyway so I did all these sort of adventures and wrote about them all on my blog and um, so anyway, and, 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 it was, and it was a real, it was a success. Lots of people read it, and um, I got some seed funding to make a documentary. So that was all really terrific. And that was my first adventure online with, a, with, a, with an ugly, unloved animal. And then my second adventure um, involved uh, another mean and lowly creature, which is the sloth, which is another one that sort of uh, didn't get named very well. And sloths, um, here you see the first ever quote from uh, a, about a sloth, which was from George Buffon. You know, the lowest forms of existence. One, one more defect would have made their lives impossible. <laughs> I mean, it was it was about 100 years before we had written on the origin of the species, but still, you know, I mean, it's pretty ignorant. But, you know, it, it's, it's a really enduring legacy, that name, and, and people really do think sloths are lazy and stupid and dirty. Um, but I think they're, you know, they're amazing. You know, the, the being slow is, is, is a really incredible evolutionary strategy, and they've got an incredible story to tell. And I, I went and visited a sloth sanctuary in Costa Rica, and the animals that I found there were a long way from being lazy, stupid, stupid and dirty. They're actually incredibly funny and adorable and wonderful and I made a short video about them which I post online which here it is <laughs> Sometimes they just don't get round to eating here because I'm not a bee, little snooze. Yeah, so uh, I made that video, and um, and that w video uh, went very, very viral very quickly. It was watched by um, about a million people in the first week alone, and um, was tweeted by all sorts of famous people like Ashton Kutcher and Ricky Gervais and got lots of press all around the world. Um, and I've made a series of virals about the same sanctuary that have had um, now, I think it's more than 10 million views online. 
And what this is is an incredible calling card um, for telling a story about this species. So, I mean, obviously the video doesn't really tell you anything about sloths other than the fact that they're surprisingly cute. But um, I've got uh, a website that I've created, the Sloth Appreciation Society, um, uh, which promotes uh, the, the sloth as the true king of the jungle. Um, <laughs> and the idea that there's nothing so great about being fast, you know? What's so brilliant about being fast? Being slow is good too, you know? So, so, um, so the Sloth Appreciation, Slothville online, and then, you know, and I do talks this summer, I'm doing several talks, it's a sort of sloth stand-up that I'm, I'm touring around music festivals in England, and there's a lot of followers now in the Sloth Appreciation Society, and actually, the badges that you see in the middle there, you've probably seen people around here wearing them, if you come up to me afterwards, I have got badges, if you want to join the club. So, um... But I mean, the thing is, is uh, what I, what, with this sort of supporting media, is I tell a wider story about the evolution and the conservation needs for the for the sloth. And the great thing is, is that I've also managed to get off the back of all of this a, a documentary which um, aired recently and was incredibly popular. It got seven times the normal viewing figures and has just been a finalist in the most popular um, documentary in the Wild Screen Awards this year and is now being greenlit for a series. So there's a lot more information that's going to be out there about the sloth, which I'm really pleased about. Um, and they've become very famous indeed now. The thing is, is that, oh yes, and the Washington Post recently said that sloths are the new kittens, which, um, <laughs> you know, isn't, I was obviously not right. And, uh, and, and that's a sort of, <laughs> the, the ki kittens were the previous darlings of the internet, and now the sloths are a contender, apparently. Now, but there's a very important message in that, is obviously sloths aren't kittens, uh, and they're not pets, and they shouldn't be kept as pets, and I'm very concerned that, about the illegal pet trade and that the, the message gets across about that. So um, I'm developing an app now that's an adopt-a-sloth app that people will have on their iPhones and iPads, that they can have a pet sloth and they can care for it, and they can even choose what it dreams about at night, whether it wants to be a racing car driver or a surf. Um, um, but it's a, and it's a way, and, and what I love is that it's, it's one of the, you know, these new opportunities of telling stories that, you know, it's a way to be playful and, without, and get a serious message across without being preachy. And the really terrific thing about all of this is that I've discovered that, you know, the way that the online world works and with the Sloth Appreciation Society is that I now know all these sloth fans are and I've managed to gather them together and I deliver them sloth cute crack and every now and again I ask them to donate money. <laughs> and, uh, and so I've managed to raise for the, for the sanctuary over $30,000 to support the work that they're doing, which is important because for some reason sloths have slipped under the radar and there's been hardly any scientific research done into them. So, I mean, that's really great that it shows that media exposure can equal conservation dollars, which is a really great thing because I read a study recently, um, there was an academic study that was done, published a couple of years ago that said that the charismatic megafauna um, command the lion's share, pun intended, of conservation uh, funding and, and scientific um, research. And there are actually 500 times more papers that are published about big furry mammals than there are about endangered amphibians. So obviously this is, you know, this is, this is the wrong way round. Um, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't be protecting uh, the charismatic ones, but I just think we need to sort of be spreading that love around. And I know lots of herpetologists complain to me endlessly about how difficult it is for them to get funding for, frog, for their frog work, which seems to me a great shame. So um, last year, I was lucky enough that National Geographic Television gave me an opportunity to make a TV series. And when they said, you know, what would you be interested in doing? And I said, well, you know, I'd like to go places and ignore the charismatic megafauna and look at all the other wonderful animals there are out there that maybe don't get quite so much attention. So uh, it was a three-part series. It's called Freaks and Creeps. And we went to Borneo. There is more to Borneo than orangutans. So... <laughs> And uh, these are some of the other animals that you have in Borneo. And, and it was really important to me to sort of look at how they, they all fit together as well, because um, it's all one big Jenga game and don't, you don't know which piece if you pull it out that it's, it's all going to collapse. So, um, and one of the things that I really wanted to do was to shine a light on the, the scientists and the, and the conservationists who are at the coal face of conservation, who might be looking after or trying to protect an animal that, that doesn't get much media attention and isn't really very sexy. So, for instance, I've always felt, you know, Where's the Jane Goodall of dung beetles? Why don't you get to see them? Why aren't they famous, you know? Um, so we, we actually sought out and we, we found the Jane Goodall of dung beetles. Here he is. He's called Mike Senior. And, and he's a man who craps for conservation. And if that doesn't deserve a medal, 
I don't know what does, but he literally does. If you're, if you're a dung beetle specialist, you are expected to provide your own bait. And I'm just going to leave it at that, folks, for you to figure out what I mean by that. But if you watch the show, uh, I've got a clip, but I'm going to run out of time if I play it. So um, I'm going to finish off by saying that it's um, two and a half thousand years since um, Aristotle came out with his, his message. And back in those days, he only really had one way to get his message across. And today, the planet may be in a significantly worse state. But the good news is, is that we now have so many ways that are cheap and creative to get our stories out there and to reach an audience who cares. And that's got to be a good thing. Thank you. Thank you.